What's going on, mi gente? What's up? Listen, it's Thursday, two days after the election. So much to talk about. Oh my God, what a week, right? The anxiety level is crazy. That is not just even for our nation, but for the world, I think, at this point. But listen, we are going to make a delicious cocktail to help us get us through this because we need a winner. And that is the name of our cocktail. It is called The Winner, and hopefully we'll know soon who is going to be the president of the United States and vice president and, you know, so forth and so on. So listen, let's get started. We're going to make, again, we're going to be stirring our cocktail. It's going to be bitters, a dash of orange bitters. You're going to hit a part of gin and a part of bourbon. It is a good one. Maraschino cherry, good, good. So first we just start with our um, dashes. One dash. That's all you need. One dash. That's all you need. And then you're going to do two ounces of gin. Two ounces of bourbon. And guys, this is like no joke, okay? This is just, this is to like sit. This is not crazy. I like to put a little bit of maraschino cherry in there. And then you just gonna mix. It is, that's, that's what is needed. Listen, we have Kenneth Romero with us today. Uh, we have Federico de Jesus, who is a political analyst. And we're so thankful to have him here to break everything down. Not only for the U.S. Uh, elections, but he's currently in Puerto Rico. And we're going to talk about what is going on in Puerto Rico, my friends. Also with us, we have Tia Fuller, who is a Grammy-nominated artist for saxophone. Yo, guys, tomorrow is National Saxophone Day. Did you know that? Mm. I don't know, because I didn't know that. And so I started doing some research on my friend Tia this is National Saxophone Day. Can't wait to have her here with us. She's awesome. I styled her for the Grammys. Oh, can't wait to talk about all of that. All right, guys. Can you taste that? It's no joke. And it's what we need today. Listen, we're going to get your martini glass. You're going to dump the water. Beautiful. I'm going to leave a little bit of ice in there. And then we're going to go ahead and drain. Let's go ahead and drain it. And here you go. Here is the winner. Now we're just going to garnish this with a little maraschino cherry. And we're just going to go ahead and put that in there. And there you have it, guys. So hopefully, maybe we'll know who the winner is before the show is over. Who knows? Listen, anyway, we're going to get started, all right? So salut, and I'll see you in a minute, all right? World, hold on. He's saying it. Oh, so good. We got to hold on. We have to be patient, right? We'll be patient. Count all the votes, all right? We'll see you in a minute. Bye. <laughs> Hey, 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 buenas noches, mi gente. Good evening, my people, and welcome back to Conciencias con Cocktails with me, Javier Pedrosa. Listen, thank you so much to each and every one of you for tuning in today and every Thursday at 6 p.m. on Solivity.com, Solivity Latinx, also on Solivity's Magazine's channel on YouTube, Facebook Live, and Twitter. And if you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube Live, comment. Any questions come up during the show, please, by all means, let us know what is going on through your heads so that way we can answer any questions you may have. Also, be sure to follow us on the IG at Conciencias Con Cocktails. Guys, we are finally in November, but hold out, first of all, 
this is my birthday month. And I don't know, you know that, but I have to say pretty happy birthday to my twin brother, Ariel, because I am a twin. But this whole November, we are going to be celebrating up and down because I'm, you know, November 19th. El Día del Descubrimiento de Puerto Rico. Dique. But, you know, we'll get to that. But listen, also I want to say Lina Sanchez in Puerto Rico, the Ay Bonito Puerto Rico. Happy birthday to you today. I love you. You've been my sister since the fourth grade. And Ay Bonito, <laughs> since the fourth grade. And today is your birthday. I know 2020 was a little tough, but you know what? We hope 2021 brings you everything you deserve, mi amor. Así que besitos, and I hope you're having a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful birthday in Puerto Rico. So we are also two days after the presidential election. You know what? Today is November 5th. We are 55 days away from the end of the year. That's insane. But we can't think about that. Okay. We can't go that far because we don't have a, an elected president just yet. So we got to wait on New Year's. Today, as I said, is the only is the only the second day after our presidential election. And unfortunately, before we get to that, I have to say a coronavirus pandemic in the United States is going insane. Sadly, the U.S. Uh, uh, records more than 100,000 new coronavirus cases in a single day. And that is, you know, 102 103,000 new cases of COVID-19 on Wednesday, and that was according to a tally by John Hopkins University, and it, mar it marked the first time where the country's daily new cases reached six figures and is the highest single-day jump in infections since the pandemic began. So the pandemic is not gone. I mean, it's still here. The U.S. also recorded 1,097 more coronavirus-related deaths on Wednesday. And again, please, you guys, wear your masks. We have to wear a mask because if we don't wear a mask, this is not going to go anywhere. So, por favor, Pónganse esas máscaras, por Dios. <laughs> so listen, guys, we are going to jump right in because obviously we have to we have to jump in. And I'm so excited today because we have three amazing forces that we are going to highlight. One, we they have made significant, significant impacts in their own gorgeous ways. With us, we have our Kenneth Romero, who is the executive director at the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators. And we also have Federico De Jesus, a political analyst and founder and principal of FDJ Solutions, LLC. And we are going to examine our political news today. And remember, every last Thursday of the month, join us because we have the Carrica and Romero segment. And again, I know when it comes to November 26, there's going to be a lot to talk about because this is not going to be over anytime soon. Also with us, we have Grammy-nominated artist and accomplished educator. I mean, Tia Fuller is like one of those hearts that you just want to take with you and just pack it up and go everywhere with this little heart because she is an amazing, amazing person. But she's a diva. Like, on top of that, she's a diva. She has... Gone around the world with pop diva Beyonce, and she has been featured in I Am Sasha Fears, the Beyonce Experience, and live at the Wind Theater Worldwide Tours 2006 to 2010. In addition, she serves as assistant musical director for Who Esperanza Spalding, yo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Full, listen, she has recorded five albums. And she has received a Grammy nomination for Best Jazz Instrumental Album for her album, Diamond Cut, which we had such a beautiful experience at the Grammys. But I'm going to tell you about that later when, when she's on with us. So stay tuned for Tia. All right, guys, before we get to our spotlight, obviously we need to say hello to our fourth guest, our signature cocktail, the winner. This is called the winner because we need a winner. We need a winner. When are we going to get it? Listen, bitter, bourbon, orange, gin, maraschino, and that's it. Easy. Uh, we need a winner. It's nice and strong because we need it. Salute to everyone out there because, you know, it's rude if I don't do this. <laughs> mm. It's no joke. <laughs> it's no joke. It's no joke. It's, it's, she's, she's. <laughs> 
This is perfect for today. <laughs> All right, guys, listen. Again, let's go into our spotlight and let's go ahead and bring in our Mr. Kenneth Romero and Federico de Jesus to the conversation. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you? Hello. Oh, great. Hola, hola, hola. Okay, guys, listen. First of all, welcome for, you know, you guys know Kenneth. Kenneth has been hanging out around with us for the past, what, like four months or so. So you already know how fantastic and fabulous Kenneth is. And of course, Federico is his, like Bessie. So you have to know how amazing he is. And Washington, D.C., although he's now in Puerto Rico, y'all. So we're going to talk about Puerto Rico a little bit because obviously we have to talk about these elections in Puerto Rico too, but he is a great, great guy. He has been a consultant in Washington, D.C. for more than 17 years at the highest levels of government and communication. He was the National communication, Communications Director for Hispanic Media in the Obama for America 2008 presidential campaign, where he helped to secure close to 70% of the Latino vote. So that's Federico. Welcome, Federico. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you really for being excited. here. With us. I don't know if I deserve all of that hoopla, but I hope to live <laughs> up to the high. I'm only speaking. I'm only speaking truth here. I'm only speaking truth. All right, guys, listen. Sarah McBride, the first trans senator in U.S. history. This is a big moment that is coming out of the 2020 elections because, again, the first one. You know, she's 30 years old and and soon will represent the state of district uh, in, in Delaware. And that's amazing. What do you guys think about Sarah McBride? Kenneth, let's start with you. Yeah, I, th I think I think this is wonderful news for the LGBTQ community. We, we continue to, you know, uh, gain more uh, political power and making sure that the LGBTQ uh, community is represented at those important tables, right? Where policies are made, where laws are made that impact our daily lives. And so it's great. I think it's really interesting the fact that uh, she gets elected in the home state of uh, Vice President Biden, right? Uh, which is kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, fact, right? But it, but it's just great, and and we hope to see. Obviously, uh, I haven't looked at all of the details in terms of you know local races across the country, uh, but it's great to see that that she made it in Delaware, and it'd be interesting to see of others. I, I know that actually there's there's a There's a sheriff elect now in Ohio that actually, so the, a sheriff of this town in Ohio fired after 30 years of service, this woman, because she came out as lesbian. And so she decided to run against the sheriff and she just got elected. Now she's the new sheriff. All right. So it's so glad glad to see those uh, moments, right, and those 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 important uh, milestones for the community. Absolutely. What do you think, Mr. Federico? Well, I, I agree with Kenneth. I think definitely a great milestone. I remember the 2018 election that brought it brought in so many women, so many minorities. We had a trans uh, elected from Virginia as well. So I'm glad to see that Delaware is catching up with the DMV area. Um, and so, you know, I know we're going to talk about Richie in a little while, but it's a great trend, especially in D.C., especially in the capital that, you know, everybody talks about Oscars being so white. The capital is a very white place, not just with the members, but also the staff. Um, that's, been, that's been improving. And obviously, this is a great trend. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah, and you know, she joins a handful of other transgender politicians around the country, but this election makes her the highest ranking transgender official in the country. So, felicidades, Miss Sarah McBride. That is everything. I mean, that is such a like spotlight, you know, it's such a bright light for the LGBTQ plus community, especially, you know, with this new um, uh, Supreme Court justice going in and all these uh, talk about our rights being kind of, you know, played with. So I think this is a really, really amazing, amazing story. Continuing on that, Richie Torres. Hello, Afro-Latino de Puerto Rico, you know, from the Bronx. And he is the first one, you know, uh, to become an openly gay candidate, uh, along with Manjer Jones, which we'll, we'll talk about him next. But Richie Torres, wow, what an amazing, amazing win. What do you guys, I mean, uh, Kenneth, I know that you and Richie, like, you know who... You followed his work so much. Like, tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, I mean, he's just, uh, you know, really a powerhouse coming into Congress. I mean, just an incredible story, right, of, you know, Afro-Latino. So this is a this is a district that is actually mostly comprised of Latinos and African-Americans. And actually, he brings in both heritages to, to this seat, and he becomes the first um, Afro-Latino LGBTQ member of Congress, right? And, and so... Uh, we couldn't be more excited, really. I mean, and and he's such a knowledgeable, intelligent uh, guy. I mean, he he right now sits in in the city. He was sitting in the city council, right? And so now he goes from there. He jumps all the way to Congress, right? So it's a quite a remarkable uh, jump. Uh, but just just really very knowledgeable about the issues, not the, just the issues that are important to his the community, like affordable housing and minimum wage. That those are some of the topics that he's very focused on, but also just, you know, on international foreign affairs. I mean, just very knowledgeable. So uh, I couldn't be prouder. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that he beat such a homophobic politician, you know, is another one like our lesbian sister whooping that ass <laughs> to the sheriff, you know, like don't mess with us, you know, like literally that was that that you almost want them to win just because you know the hurdles that they have to pass. What do you what do you think, Federico, about Richie Torres? Dude, you, you stole my thunder. I was exactly about to say that that ah. Richie's victory was even sweeter because he beat Ruben Diaz. Ruben Diaz, for all those things you said and many more, would have been a disaster. Uh, I as a Latino, as a Puerto Rican, would have been ashamed that he be you know sending your community in Congress, especially given that he's replacing really the dean of Puerto Ricans and a lot of Latinos. So, so Serrano, it's so sad that, you know, he got Parkinson's to leave. He leaves such a legacy. But Richie brings in a lot of dynamism, uh, youth, uh, you know, can I better do? I, I am glad that he got elected. Um, and also, you know, that he's a millennial. I think that being Afro-descendant, being openly gay, being Puerto Rican, being uh, from New York, you know, such an important city for Latinos. You know, people really mistake New York City as such a diverse place. It is, but sometimes that diversity isn't always respected. You know, New York is in Boston, uh, but it isn't necessarily DuPont Circle in DC. Uh, so I think that there's still barriers to be broken, and I'm really glad that, that Richie broke that, especially he prevented a retrograde to represent our community in Congress. That would have been shameful. I personally supported one of his opponents, Melissa Marguerito, but again, I was really glad that we have a place in Pekin representing us in the Congress, and I'm really glad that he's going to be there and look forward to working with him. And yeah, and especially, you know, in this world that we're living in where, you know, we have to see ourselves. We have to see ourselves, especially in politics. And that's why I'm so happy, again, with the Black Lives Matter movement happening for Mondaire Jones, a 33-year-old New York Democrat who is a Harvard Law graduate who also worked for President Obama in the Justice Department. And the funny thing is that, you know, I looked, I, I researched him so much, and it, it's funny that he was inspired to run for office after AOC won. After she won, she shocked the nation by unseating longtime, you know, Joe Crowley. And that's uh, District 14, you know, and he's District 17. And that really inspired him to say, you know what? They're not doing enough. I'm going to run. Kenneth, what are your thoughts about Mondaire Jones? And again, African-American and openly gay. Yeah, well, he shares with Richie Torres, you know, becoming the first uh, openly uh, uh, gay Latino in Congress. Uh, I'm sorry, the openly gay uh, member of Congress from that from for the CBC, right? And so uh, um, Richie would be for the CHC for the Congressional Hispanic Congress. Uh, but just wonderful. I mean, and that they were inspired. That he was inspired by AOC. Uh, I think is great, right? It, it, we need more people to be inspired by those that are, you know, op you know, uh, uh, opening those 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 roads for others for the generations that are coming. And so, I mean, obviously AOC is very young, but the fact that she was so inspiring, I think it's great that 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 you're seeing that more and more. I, yes, and I cannot wait for the next elections because I feel like we're going to see a lot more Latinos 
coming through the ballots as time progresses. It's just, I just feel like it's going to happen naturally. It's going to happen. What do you think, Mr. Federico, about Manjer Jones? Well, first of all, I, I, dis I respectfully disagree. Things don't just naturally happen. We got to make them happen. Chito made his race happen. He was running against a lot of experienced people and he bucked the trend. The AOC that you mentioned also, you know, took on the establishment. So just don't organically happen. You have to organize and work at it hard. Um, and demo demography is in destiny. Uh, I, I don't know the, this individual, but I go back to something that Kenneth said, and this is kind of inside baseball, but I think it's important in Congress. For some reason, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus allowed to serve the Congressional Black Caucus as well as the Hispanic Caucus. And so I'm glad that Richie identifies as both. He should be able to participate in both. You know, this trend is multiracial, multiethnic, uh, biracial. So I think that that's something that if we really want to keep up with the times, people in Congress need to also keep up with how people identify with multiple identities. Um, and so anything that adds to that diversity um, is great. I remember when I worked staff in Congress, uh, a lot of uh, black members of Congress complained that they were always pigeonholed into urban and this issue and businesses wouldn't even support them. And there are a lot of diversity. Not all of us are liberal. Not all of us are urban. A lot of us have different interests and different uh, ideologies. What makes this country And I think that that's what we need in Congress. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, you bring up a good, good point. Actually, two good points. One is I remember when, you know, the elections happened and the Black Caucus and he's Latino and that, like, can you guys talk a little bit about the Black Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus and how will that affect Richie Torres and how he should be welcomed in both? How do you guys feel about that, Kenneth? Well, I mean, you have to respect the fact that he self-identifies as a member of both communities, and he actually represents a district that is comprised of these two communities, right? And so it's like being asked, uh, trying to be for, it's like, who do you love more, your mom or your dad? Well, you don't have to make those choices. You can love them both, right? And so you can represent both communities and do so very effectively. The issues are not necessarily always the same, but he wants to represent both of them with equal importance. And that's the, that's the key here. So I think it's, for, it's in the best interest of CHC, of CBC, of, 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 the, of just representation and democracy, right? That people should be allowed to participate in the caucuses that they feel that they belong to, right? And that there should be no impediment to that, right? Um, and he has made it very clear that he intends to give that fight, that he wants to be a member of both caucuses. Right, and he should be allowed to be a member of both. I agree. I agree. Do you agree with that, Federico? Of course. Like having your woods and just asking him to have to choose to be in the Asian caucus or in the Black caucus, you know, he's, he shouldn't have to choose. And I had a stepdad, and I love him too, and nobody asked me to. Choose, so uh, we shouldn't ask a member of Congress to choose either. And let me let me just point out, actually, Senator Harris. Senator Kamala Harris, she's a member of the Asian caucus and as well as the Black caucus, right? So you have, a, it's it's always been an issue when it happens to be an Afro-Latino. So Adriano Espaillat, for example, had to make that choice. Antonio Delgado had to make that choice. And that choice is unfair. It's so it's, unfair. It, you know, and, and we, we need to stop that. We need, you know, I mean, you, you uh, Javier, you're, you're Colombiano and you're Puerto Rican, right? Like, And you feel just as proud of that, Harry. 50 50. Yo soy los dos. Porque si no, no soy hijo de mi madre. I, if I, I am 50 50. If I, if I don't say that I am Colombian, then I don't have a mom. You know what I mean? And that is so disrespectful. And actually, that is what makes us who we are. For people to understand that I was raised in Ibonito, Puerto Rico. So I understand the Caribbean experience, my Afro-Latino family. I understand what that is. And I understand what my white Colombian family is and what the challenges of South America are versus the challenges in the Caribbean versus the challenges in Central America. Which brings me to the next point, the Latino vote. What is going on, guys? I want to say that this, this elections have been eye-opening because la gente, people don't know what to do with us. They want to put us in a voting block. You know, like we are part of like, you know, there's a black vote, there's the white vote, and they want to say the Latino vote. 
and they just realized they can't do that. Federico, what do you think about what's going on with the Latino vote in uh, Washington? Well, let, let me quote uh, my good friend Kenneth Romero, who recently tweeted, there's no such thing as the Latino vote. You have to talk about voters. And, you know, and even the subgroups, you can't just say, well, the Puerto Rican vote. Well, what are you? Puerto Colombian. Is his Colombian half pro-Trump because people in Colombia hated Chavez? Or is it his side who saw Donald throwing paper towels at his people and decided that he wanted to vote against him? Or did you say, yeah, take a one money those corrupt politicians at Dan Milan? I mean, we have such a plethora of, of points of view that putting us in a box, um, it's just not right. But I, I do have to say, and others, um, we, we spoke privately, some of us publicly, about the need for Democrats to identify this micro-targeting that was really good at. And a lot of people were saying, well, how come Trump got close to 30% of the Latino vote in 2016 after he insulted Mexicans and immigrants? Well, you know what? There's racist and anti-immigrants and classist in, other, in the Latino community. You know, that's the fact. And if you don't target people, if you don't go to where they are, if you don't send the WhatsApp messages, even if it's disinformation from Russia or from wherever, they're getting those messages. And if you don't compete, uh, half of the, the bad one biting up. So I think that the Biden came in late into the game. I think that Democrats in 2018, uh, you know, they drunk about a blue wave and they didn't see that in Florida. Rick Scott got elected in part because of 40 plus percent of the Puerto Rican vote. So, and you see the exit polls, as Puerto Ricans turned out, 72% of us voted for Biden in Florida. But guess what? 71% voted for Trump in the, in the community, right? And they also targeted Colombians, Venezuelans, even Haitians uh, with their issues, and Democrats need to get on the ball with that. Uh, you know, some comes down Democrats thinking that just because you're right on policy, that that translates into tactics and strategy. And the two are completely this. You can write on the issue in getting your message out and targeting people. So I think we have a lot to learn, um, but I am proud that Boricuas came out and voted for the candidate. As to Lily, what do you think, Kenneth? Yeah, I mean, as, as, as Federico was mentioning, I tweeted today that, you know, you got to stop talking about the Latino vote. People have to talk about Latino voters. And even that needs to be break, broken up, not just by heritage, right? Another, whether Cuban or Puerto Rican or Colombian or Venezuelan, right? You also have to look at the geography of that community, right? Because the issues that are important to a Mexican, a, a, of Mexican heritage, Latino, uh, in Texas are completely different than a Chicano in New York City. Because the Chicano in New York City is worried about how am I going to put a roof over my head, right? Like, how am I going to make, you know, live paycheck to pay in this very expensive city? I mean, there's so many issues, right, of urban areas, right? If you go to rural areas for Latinos, it's a completely different set of priorities, right, and issues. So that's very important. Uh, there's also even generational differences because, you know, you hear a lot about, for example, the Cubanos, right, that they are all, you know, pro-Trump. Well, first of all, that's not necessarily true, by the way. You have to look at the numbers. But also there's a generational difference, a divide. The old guard, those that, you know, came from Cuba that actually were born in Cuba are, you know, tend to be very Republican. But then the younger generations, like their grandchildren, they never have been to Cuba. They don't identify with those issues. They, they tell their grandparents, you guys got to stop talk, this, all this talk about Castro, right? Yeah, yeah. Many of them being more liberal than their grandparents, right? So there's a lot of differences. And the important thing, going to what Federico was saying, is the missed opportunity then for the parties, and particularly in this case the, for the Democratic Party, to be able to you know, ahead of time, be able to work with these communities. You can't knock on the doors of com of communities, uh, Hispanic communities and Latino voters two months before the election. You just can't. It's too late. By then, they've already made their decision. And particularly in this election, right, because people were already very, I mean, the, the, the amount of undecided folks was much smaller. Like people either love or they hate Trump. That's it. They had already made up their mind, right? And so, so you need to cultivate these 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 communities ahead of time, right? If you want to see the return on that investment on election day. Yes, and you know, I think like 
in the next four years, we'll see the next election, how they're going to cater to all these individual, you know, Los Venezolanos, Los uh, uh, Nicaraguenses, and Cubanos, and the, you know, those generations that we were talking about with their trauma, because really it's trauma that they're dealing with, right? So go ahead, Kenneth. Let me, let me just say, actually, before I forget, because this is something that Federico, he, he probably will remember this, you know, I think it was maybe a year ago, two years ago, he shared with me this study that came out of Hunter College about the Puerto Rican vote in Florida. And it was really eye-opening because what you saw in that study is that Puerto Ricans that moved to Florida because of the economic meltdown that started in 2006 uh, and all the way until Hurricane Maria, those Puerto Ricans that moved to Florida were overwhelmingly registering as Democrats. But then when you saw the Puerto Ricans that moved to Florida post Hurricane Maria, that moved because of what happened during the storm, because of the mistreatment and the federal, the poor federal response, right? They were registering more as independents. And that should have been a warning sign for the Democratic Party. Like, hey, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Absolutely. That is that is such a great point. We'll see next four years what they're going to do. But the presidential race remains too close to call. But Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden is closing in and securing in maybe securing enough electoral votes to win after news outlets projected him to win two key states in the Midwest, Wisconsin and Michigan. And according to the Associated Press, Biden has now secured 264 electoral votes. He will reach, he will need to reach, he would need to reach 270 as we know, but if he wins any of the four undecided races in Nevada, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, he wins. So there's very slim, slim uh, leads uh, everywhere. What are you guys thinking, Federico? Let's start with you. What are you thinking about the U.S. elections and, and where we're going? Well, Nevada uh, officials announced that they're not going to finish on Saturday. Uh, Pennsylvania will probably be in tonight or, or in the early uh, morning, in la madrugada, como decimos. Um, and Arizona, AP called it, NBC and CNN didn't want to call it. Uh, my Republican sources say, watch out for surprise in Arizona. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a lawsuit by Trump. Thankfully, the courts have struck down uh, Trump's attempt to stop counting in Georgia and in Michigan. They have another lawsuit in Pennsylvania that I don't think will fly. So I think that he had this fantasy, Trump did, that just because he packed the court with six to three conservatives, doesn't automatically think that there's going to be another, uh, doesn't automatically mean that there's going to be another Gore versus Bush Supreme Court uh, antiquatic ruling. So I think that it's looking good for Biden. But again, regardless of who wins, and hopefully it'll be Biden, in my own opinion, it looks like that. Uh, there has to be a lot of soul searching. The fact that half of the country uh, either is okay, supports, or is indifferent, the cast human rights violations, racism, attacks and insults, um, and chicanery that, that this president has shown them in the world is really troubling uh, from a sociological point of view beyond uh, politics. I think it's very troubling, and I think that the, the polls for Rogan um, predicting a 7% blowout in Wisconsin when there's probably going to be a recount, uh, a lot of people are ashamed that they vote Trump, and why do they vote for him, right? Uh, so a lot of soul-searching soul needs to happen. And frankly, I'm disappointed that after Hillary lost the electoral vote but won the popular vote by 3 million, which is a little less than what Biden is getting, Democrats aren't making a bigger issue of getting rid of the Electoral College. Except for Elizabeth Warren, nobody really talked about it. And yeah, it's an uphill climb. We haven't even ratified the Equal Rights Amendment for women. Just, but if you don't start, you're not going to get anywhere, right? Um, and so I think a lot of issues that are deeply rooted in America's, uh, you know, the of racism and past colonial and imperialistic adventures really don't uh, make for an educated and informed uh, voting population. I think that Florida tried in 2018 when they passed a referendum to allow uh, former inmates to be able to vote. But then the Republicans control the government and they said, well, if you don't fines, you're not going to be able to vote. That's a poll tax, ladies and gentlemen. 
uh, you know, the Civil Rights Act was struck down by the Supreme Court. There are a lot of battles that we need to fight. But for now, let's just make sure that every vote is counted and that we have a, a decent and effective and experienced person in the White House. Then we can come back into this podcast and discuss all the other issues. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to be holding a lot of people accountable after we know the results. Kenneth, what are you thinking about, uh, you know, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, Pennsylvania? Do you think Philadelphia is going to give us Pennsylvania? Yeah, well, let me start by saying and suggesting to all the pollsters out there, you need to get a new profession. I suggest maybe you should become florists, you know, like combining different flowers of different colors and trying to see what comes out of it. Hey. Just, I mean, it's just crazy. If you look at the numbers, uh, the, the, the lead that Biden had in many of the battleground states, right, and you subtract the, the error by the, 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 the margin of error by which the pollsters had Hillary winning, even with that, it shows Biden winning by a landslide. And here we are in this nail-biting election, right? To, as, of, as of right now, we don't know who's going to be the president of the United States. Now, having said that, what do I think? I think we're going to end up taking Pennsylvania, because of Philadelphia, as you're suggesting, I think we're going to take Arizona. It's going to be tight. Uh, Nevada. And I think that there's a slim chance that we're going to take Georgia. I did, too. I think Atlanta is going to be like, nah, -uh, ma'am. We're not. No, ma'am. You're not doing it. And let me and let me just. Right now, the difference is only 9,000 votes, by the way, as of this, this podcast. From like 300,000 <laughs> the first night, you know. And, and let's give credit where credit is due. Stacey Abrams, Stacey Abrams, Stacey Abrams, right? Yeah. Nobody until recently thought that Georgia could actually flip. It was considered a very red state. And all of a sudden, this African-American woman decided to go for running for, for the governorship of the state and grab everybody's attention. Like, whoa, what is happening in Georgia, right? But that didn't happen just from one day to another. She had already worked in the community, grassroots, civic, you know, getting people registered to vote. For years she had been doing that. And then it was, you know, then she decided to step in and, and run for office, right? So uh, so now you're seeing the, the, the fruits, right, of, of what had been for years, been the seeds that were planted, right? Uh, and so I think that we'll see what happens. But let me just predict this. No matter what happens in Georgia, even if Repub even if Trump gets Georgia, it will be the last time. That's it. Georgia is flipped. Georgia is flipped. And it's the same thing as what happened in Virginia across the across the river, right? Until a few years ago, nobody would think that what Virginia even purple? No way. And now today, just a few years later, nobody questions the fact that Virginia is blue. It's a blue state. And that's it. And 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 mark my words, the same thing is going to happen with Texas. The Texas, not this time, but 2024. And that's when, and when that happens, it's going to be the Republican Party that's going to want to get rid of the Electoral College. <laughs> oh my God, we are going to see in 2024 if that happens. Quoted record by it. Mr. Romero. Oh, yeah, record it. Exactly. Oh, this is already yeah, yeah. being recorded. We're going to see because I think you may be right, you know, and, and another point that Federico made about, you know, where we are as a country, we are very divided. You know, it's almost like there is no winner here, you know, because there is an uphill battle to have to deal with racism in this country, inequalities, I mean, LGBTQ protections, there is so, so much. So, I kind of, I agree with Federico in the sense that is there a winner? You know, even when we do elect someone, you know, again, we're going to be holding them accountable every single day that they're in office because that's what we have to do. Whoever is in office, that's what we have to do. We have to stay on top of them because, you know, lawsuits. Next topic, a whole bunch of lawsuits coming through. Trump had campaigned lawsuits for Pennsylvania and Michigan and has requested recount in Wisconsin, which I agree, he's close to the margin. He has every right to ask for a recount in Wisconsin. 
What's up with Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia? Do you guys think this is going to fly or do you guys, this is just more noise to get us all riled up? Kenneth, let's start with you. I think it's really that. It's just noise, right? And and if you look at challenges in the past, typically challenges are about 19 ballots here, 27 ballots that mysteriously appear, right? And so it's 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 very small uh, uh, changes in terms of the re- end results to go through all of that, right? You can't just, because you file a lawsuit, all of a sudden, you know, disenfranchise 10,000, 12,000 voters. You can't. That's There's no way that that's going to happen. So I think there's a lot of noise. It's just to keep the hope that perhaps um, there may be a chance. But I think that what that this is why it's so important that for uh, Vice President Biden to win the four states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona, because then at that point, there's the at that point, there's no point, right? It's, it's, it's a clear landslide, so to speak. And so there's no point in trying to fa- fight, you know, no matter how many legal challenges you present uh, and no matter the, uh, the fact that you pack the, the Supreme Court, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's that, and I think even today, uh, CNN, Jim Acosta was reporting that um, somebody inside the White House said that if Pennsylvania uh, came down for Biden, that it would be a knockout. It would be game over, and they know it. What do you think, Federico? Noise with the lawsuits, or do you think anything's going to stick? I mean, Kenneth is the resident lawyer here. Um, a fervor. <laughs> I haven't seen anything that's not uh, flagrantly, you know, out of bounds. So I, I doubt that thing would 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 prosper. Uh, but you never know, right? I mean, we did have Bush v. Gore. This is a president who's demonstrated time and again his vote for authoritarianism. Uh, again, the fact that half of the country is okay with that. A guy that's openly says, well, I don't want these votes to be counted. It's not fair. Well, it's not fair because it doesn't support him, right? Because he's sending mixed, mixed signals. He, he wants to stop the voting in Georgia, but continue in Arizona, not continue in, in, in Pennsylvania. I mean, it's all over the place. Uh, I was seeing an interview with one of the Bush v. Gore voter, uh, lawyers from the Republicans who said, in New Mexico, we had a good case. The problem is that it contradicted the rationale we had in Florida, and you can't have two different rationales, so it messes up your messaging. But I'm, lives in a parallel universe as voters live in a parallel universe we need to do a better job in engaging them and not living in our own bubble i think that's a self-criticism that, that i would 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 make of, of ourselves uh at least for me personally i i want to make an effort my new year's resolution will be to have more trump supporting friends uh you know we judge them hillary called them you know names and, and that's not that's not the way to win over people uh, but again, I, I do think that at the end of the day, all the votes need to be counted. There's very few lawyers who are going to actively bring up a case that's flagrantly, to, totally out of bounds. My fear was that the, the race was actually going to be closer than it has been and that he would interrupt voting because of some made up national thing or bring in troops or something like that, like out of an episode of something on Netflix. Thankfully, that hasn't happened. Um, and so I think we should just remain calm and vigilant. And the funny thing is that the only case of election fraud this year came from Pennsylvania Secretary of State and says that she's aware of this case, a Trump supporter who tried to apply for a ballot for his dead mother. One case. And that's David Begnaud reporting, again, fraud, Trump supporter, You see what I'm saying? So we're going to keep an eye on that because this is just so foolish. But before we get to Puerto Rico, because we got to talk about Puerto Rico, let's talk real quick about the Senate. What is, guys, on the Senate, what is happening with the Senate race? I mean, I think Georgia, we're going to go to January. Do you feel like we're going to go to January for Georgia? Yeah. Let me me just say, I I started saying months ago that this was going to end up being 50-50. and the path to 50-50 would mean that both seats that are now runoffs would have to be won by the Democrats. This is really interesting because we already knew at, way at, uh, ahead of time that there was already going to be a runoff in one of the Georgia seats, right, currently held by Loeffler. But it was the other one that, you know, there was more expectation that there would be a clear winner. But Georgia, under Georgia law, 
you have a runoff if, if no single candidate makes more than 50% 50 plus one uh, votes, right? And so you have three candidates in that race. And John Ossoff was able to bring down from, from 50, almost 51%, just barely underneath 50 uh, Senator Perdue. And so now they're, you know, it's going to be a runoff. What's going to be interesting is what's th that campaign, Javier, is going to be the amount of money that is going to pour in to Georgia uh, from now until January is going to be just so obscene. It's going to be like almost, I would say, like pornographic. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You're going to have every single major celebrity going to Georgia, every single, you know, NBA, NFL player, every single artist. You Hip hop artists, honey, Atlanta rules. I mean, you have Tyler Perry. You have Tyler Perry Studios out there that are going to kick in. I mean, the one thing we know is that black folks and people of color get together and create change. Yeah, like I even hear that Tia Fuller is going to go to 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 Georgia and she's going to be playing saxophone there. Tia Fuller is, has been all over the world and I, I'm sure you she's going to be in Georgia playing that sax <laughs> to get us to the White House. All right, guys, listen, Puerto Rico, we are waiting for final results of the election and... Uh, you are Puerto Rico, Federico. Tell us what's going on in Pierluisi. You have Natal in San Juan. Lugar, what's going on over there? So, so Puerto Rico is really going through a change, uh, in, in, which really started in 2016. You know, sometimes we get frustrated when Obama talked about gradual change or incremental change, and sometimes that's the way it happens. In 2016, there was an independent candidate, a woman. Alexandra Lugaro, who got 11.5%, combined with an independent candidate, they got 5%. That was historic. And now in this election, the pro-independence party candidate got almost 14% of the, this Which independent woman formed the movement. Uh, and she's also for pro-independence, but she didn't take a position, or her party didn't on status. She got more than 40%. And fine, they almost get as much as the major, the pro statehood and pro-commonwealth parties do. So we have a governor, whoever gets elected, which will have only 32% of the vote. Uh, the legislature also is a mess. The five political parties have representation, multiple representation. We have the first openly gay and uh, statehood uh, represented in the House from this new movement, Victoria Ciudadana. We have a canonic law expert from a right-wing religious party. She's pro-independent. She got elected to the Senate. Um, we have first Afro-Latina, openly lesbian woman, Anaima Lassen, who also got elected to the Senate. Uh, and they'll have to form coalitions in both houses. Um, and I think that's great. It won't necessarily make for quick and effective government, but it will bring a lot of other voices to, to the table. There was also a state referendum that was 52 to 48 percent in favor of making Puerto Rico a state. That wasn't binding in the sense that Congress isn't forced to do any. It's the first time that states more than 50 percent. Of, of any vote, um, which is significant. Uh, some people complain that because other options weren't on the table, uh, it was there, but you know, they counted the votes and state who got a majority, we'll see what Congress does. But all throughout, in San Juan, as you mentioned, uh, the movement, Victoria Ciudad, barely, I think, will lose San Juan. And Miguel Romero from the statehood party, a former labor secretary, will probably eke it out, less or less. Um, but it's very significant that the popular Democratic Party that ruled San Juan for decades under Doña Fela, decades in third place. Um, so it's a political establishment in Puerto Rico, wake-up call. They need to shake up their their uh, their way of thinking and doing things. You know, because we're talking about these issues, I have to say that, unfortunately, uh, the Popular Democratic Party that used to be a liberal party that in in favor of rights uh, and immigrant rights nominated someone who was backed by right-wing uh, religious uh, people, and you know that really took a lot of voters, and I think pushed a lot of the usually liberally minded uh, voters that the populares get to the new movements, to the independistas that are not a new movement, but Victoria Ciudadana is a new movement. So I think that in Puerto Rico, social uh, change is coming, not the way that people thought in the last summer when they kicked out a, a governor and had to resign. But it's definitely happening through the ballot box and the graying regardless of whether you like the outcome or not. 
I think that having new and different voices is always a good thing. And I'm really excited to know what, what kind of thinks about all of this. What do you think, Kenneth, about Puerto Rico? One more thing. Really quick, one more thing. I get along with her fine, but I'm personally ashamed that Puerto Rico Trump and to replacing Congress as the delegate, the voting uh, resident commissioner. There are local reasons. Obviously, Tip O'Neill nailed it when he said that all this is local, but that, that kind of sends a, a different message than I would have liked. Uh, but that's just my own personal opinion. Okay. You know, these are the elections in Puerto Rico are what we call in Puerto Rico un arroz con bicicleta. I mean, it's just crazy that the popular Democratic Party is going to take control of the House. Now, the latest information is I hear that the Senate might be the new progressive party, but then you have the smaller parties that made their you know inroads into both chambers. And so you're going to have to build coalitions to be able to select who's going to be the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. Then you have a, a the likely uh, uh, candidate for, for governor, Pierre Luisi. He's a Democrat, but then his running mate is a Republican, Trump supporter Republican. And so she would be, she's also, she's from the same party locally in Puerto Rico, you know, as the statehood party, but then here for national politics, they, they couldn't be further from each other. And it's just crazy, right, that all of this is happening. Um, I think I think in the end, I, th I see it as a triumph of democracy. And I think it's 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 a triumph against the the binary political system that has existed in Puerto Rico for decades where the power shifted from one party to the other and people were just fed up, you know, because you saw the same corruption, the same poor administration and nothing in the quality of life of the people of Puerto Rico changed, right? And so I think this says, you know, it's people, and, and a lot of it has to do with artists, right? You know, people like Ricky Martin, Bad Bunny, like getting people to be civically engaged was very important in this election. And so I think that the results that you see is that, is that people are fed up and they just want something new. They want something fresh. Some, you know, they want to elect people that are looking after their best interests and hopefully bring the change that they so desperately need. As to the plebiscite vote, um, as, as Federico was mentioning, this is a non-binding, right? So Congress is not, doesn't have to act upon it. But let me just say, It's going to be interesting because you have a situation where, for example, if Georgia, if Georgia in that runoff, Democrats win, then you would have a 50-50 Senate, which means that Kamala Harris would be the, the tiebreaker, right? I bet you anything that the first bill in Congress is going to be statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico, because politically speaking, Democrats see the demographic shift in the country. And they see places like Wyoming, like, like North Dakota. There, there's more residents in D.C. In North, than in North Dakota. And yet North Dakota has two senators, right? Two senators for, what, three quarters of a million, like 750,000 people. There's 30 million people living in California, and they still have the same two senators, right? So it's, it's just crazy. And so the power dynamics there are going to change. I mean, Democrats are, are really seriously taking a look at that plebiscite in Puerto Rico. And obviously, D.C. has already uh, voted on this in the past. So, so it, that's going to be up for consideration because that would bring Democrats four seats, right? Well, at least two in D.C. Puerto Rico is kind of um, would probably be a Democratic state if it were to become a state, but because of the local politicians right now, and some of them being part of the Republican party, there may be some, you know, robot, like, you know, it, it may be, it may have to it require a few years before, you know, it smooths out. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they, they're banking on having four seats in the Senate, four secure seats in the Senate. Well, we are going to keep our eyes open and to see what's going on in Puerto Rico. Listen, guys, thank you so much to both of you for being here, Kenneth and Federico. We can be here all day, obviously, chatting it up. But obviously, you're going to have to come back, Federico. It is what it is. And you will you. see Kenneth uh, back uh, the last Thursday of November because there's going to be more to talk about. Really quickly, Kenneth, give us your social medias. And Federico, give us your social media. So if anybody has any political questions or anything, they can contact you guys. Sure. So we're at NHCSL. 
uh, on Facebook and Twitter, and you can follow me at Ken Romero Cruz on uh, as well. Uh, you can look me up on both Facebook and Twitter. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, to anyone out there about the Hispanic community uh, and the future in terms of the political power. Beautiful, Federico. Uh, my personal handle is at uh, F Jesus Febles. I wrote it down here in case you want to display it. And at FDJ Solutions DC, which is probably easier for people to remember on Twitter and on Facebook. The forward engaging in the conversation. And thanks so much for talking about these issues and for inviting me. I, I've spoken to Kenneth privately about all of this and I really enjoyed it being here for him. Uh, thank you so much. Like I said, ahora somos hermanos, así que we're going to see you more often on the show. Y mi abuela y pitos, so proud y boniteños aquí representando. That's right. ¿Tú eres bonito o no? Mi abuela, mi abuela, mi abuela. Abuelita. That's why I knew I loved you. All right, guys. Besitos a los dos y abrazos. And I will see you guys very, very soon. Guys, next on CO3 Lounge, I'm so excited because we have Tia Fula and she is incredible. So listen, we're going to take a one minute break. We're going to refill our cocktails and then we're going to be right back with Tia Fuller. So stay tuned. My name is Brian Wesley Johnson, and I want to welcome you to another edition of Soul Liberty Live. Hey, how you doing, sir? My sister, how are you? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might need some more wine for this. So, let's get this party started, y'all. Hey, my sister, Mademoiselle. I, that is the most amazing introduction I've ever heard. Oh. Oh, what an amazing day. The gold made is even more amazing. Myself and Madison, Brian Wesley Johnson. Thank you for joining us on Saturday morning. Full of passion, purpose, and high quality living. See you next time. Bye. Watch Soul Liberty Live with Brian Wesley Johnson every Saturday at 10 a.m. right here on Soul Liberty TV. Coming up next, it's time for our CO3 Lounge. Hey guys, what's going on? All right, listen guys. Again, Tia Fuller, an amazing person, but an incredible art artist, a musician for days. I'm going to show you really quick, a quick, quick clip so you can see her. Check her out. That's right. It is Tia Fuller. What's going on, Tia Fuller? <laughs> How you doing, Javier? So good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. Salud. What are you yeah. doing over there, sweet? I, I got me some red vino. Hey. The red, the, the red Zinfandel. I'm trying out. I can't even remember the brand, but it's good. And it's <laughs> yes, very <I'm> much good. <laughs> needed. <laughs> okay. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Well, baby, thank you so much for coming through. You know, guys, we we thought we were going to have, like, an election done yeah. over with, and we were going to go on with our lives. And I said, I want to invite Tia Fuller because tomorrow, November 6th, is National Saxophone Day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It is a national day, and I am so thrilled to have you because you are like the like artist no. to, to to you know uh, represent the beautiful genre. I mean, you've taken it from again. You've traveled the world with you know Beyonce and other artists like uh, 
uh, everyone. I mean, you just worked with everyone and now you're at Berkeley teaching. Talk to me about what's it to you? I want to teach the next generation of musicians. Yeah. So ironically enough, Kenneth was talking about um, going to Atlanta and playing with the saxophone. And um, so Atlanta is actually my, um, well, Spelman is my alma mater, my undergraduate alma mater. And um, at Berkeley, uh, not only am I teaching um, ensembles, a couple of ensembles that range between jazz, um, R&B, hip hop, I have a Rihanna ensemble, um, it's been really extraordinary, but now I've actually taken on a couple of initiatives where I'm uh, the artistic director of the ensemble department. And the one I'm really excited about is I'm the founding director of this new Berkeley and Spelman domestic exchange program. So basically sisters from Berkeley will be able to go to Spelman and experience the culture and the music of, of, of the Atlanta University Center and then vice versa. Sisters from Spelman will be able to come up here to Berkeley who really want to dig deeper into their, their artistry and expertise as an instrumentalist or vocalist. And so overall, I'm just, I'm so thankful and excited to, um, to be able to be a vessel in that area because to me, music is a microcosm of life. And this is something that I always share with my students. It's about... Um, we are a vessel for what is going on out there. We are a vessel for um, uh, our emotions and um, to use this intentfully and purposely so that they can continue to walk into their purpose. Right, right. And yeah. especially again with the world today. Yeah. yeah. It's so healing, you know, that we all need to take 10, 15 minutes and listen to some great something. I always encourage for people to dance. Uh-huh, that's it. Dance, just yes, yes. Up, you, know, <laughs> you have to, you know, you yes. have to motivate yourself, especially with COVID and staying home and all this jazz. How has it been now? Because again, you're an educator. Yeah. Do, are you guys uh, going virtual with your classes? How are you dealing with that? Yeah, yeah, we're doing complete virtual for this is the second semester. We started last semester in the spring and it is a challenge. Um, I wouldn't say, I think this is of course new for everybody, but as faculty and and teaching music is such a tactile, it's, it's as tactile as dancing because you know it's energy oriented, it's community oriented. And um, to be in front of, we're just not dealing with content, but we're dealing with spirit. We're dealing with emotion. We're dealing with communication. We're dealing with nuances and being able to communicate within the depths, you know, of the music. And to not to even be able to play all together because of the latency on um, on our computers, we as faculty have to come up with some new and creative ways of engagement. And um so it, it's been good because I've been able to tap into other things that I wouldn't normally do in right. the classroom, but it's, it's stretching. It's definitely stretching me. And, um, and, and I've been able to get into some very um, nuanced conversations with students as well um, and to dig deeper as to how, like how this music can service us during this time of this pandemic and the election and not negate any of that, but to bring it all together in the classroom and our conversations and allowing the music to be a vehicle for that. Yes. And, you know, yeah. I want to let my, my people know, Tia was, uh, you know, nominated again for a Grammy for um, artist. I mean, she, it was like that moment, that moment, but for best jazz album. And you were the only, you had been the second lady. Yes. And I've never been nominated in this category. I mean, that in itself, it's such a win. Yeah. It, to me, that just looking at it from a historical standpoint and being in a category with men who I grew up listening to, who are like the Michael Angelos of, of jazz, yeah. uh, Wayne Shorter, who won, um, just being amongst them is an honor. And, um, but we can't, we, we cannot leave out the fact, Javier, that you were in my stylist for the, so I don't, I didn't want to jump ahead, but, but I just wanted to make sure that I was giving you kudos and oh. that you, like you, and, and of course with Jerry's assistance, 
you all just made this experience so extraordinary for me. It's unforgettable. And every time I speak about the Grammys, I think about that table, that banquet table filled of hair supplies and makeup. Maria. And the dirty dresses in the back and my earrings. Um, you know, and then all of that amazing jewelry you brought. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because you brought the spirit and you were you were just working. And it got me on the front of the magazine. What was the name of that magazine? Yeah, we you were on the cover of a Bolivian newspaper that's, that's making right. the best because Erika Weiss, who is a Bolivian designer, yeah. made a couture piece for Tia that was inspired by the album The Diamond Cut. Yes. So it was such a beautiful thing. And I thank you because I I love that experience so much. Your father, meeting your father yes. and your best friend, Margo, and your sister. I mean, that, uh, that moment was so beautiful. And again, it was such a beautiful moment because I remember almost seeing your transition from like the saxophone band player to the diva herself. Yes. Right? You did that though. You you implanted that in my brain because I was just like, okay, I'm a saxophonist. Let me just find a dress. You were like, oh no, honey. Oh no, Danica. Oh no, we, this is gonna go all out. It's done. And you really brought me there, and uh, I'm just so thankful because that that dress, woo, was extraordinary. Oh, and it was. It, I mean, I was next to, I actually ranked above uh, for best dress list, J-Lo and uh, Lady Gaga. And then ranked as Angela Bassett. Yes. Yes. You were like screaming little girls. (laughs) (laughs) But it was, again, it's such a beautiful experience. Another thing that was so, so beautiful, it was the amazing melanin that was in the room. And again, so many talented people, you know, Jarris, myself, you, like, it. you know, we, that w- that in itself is such a dream to, yes. get, to get our queens ready oh. to get on that carpet and deliver what y'all were supposed to deliver, you know? Yeah. So it, it was a pleasure for me. So I want to say thank you to you oh. because that was incredible. It was an incredible experience. And you were my first Grammy address. <laughs> yeah. so, we're all we're gonna be connected forever and ever. Yes, now. yes, we are, Javi. Yes, we are, Javi. We are. And listen, I want to talk about um, what's going on with Tia in the future. Where are you yeah. going? Because I feel like you're gonna take over the world. Oh well, I received that. <laughs> you know, um, right now it's it's been really good because it's allowed. Wow. For, this is the first That's time right. in about twenty years that I've been able to be still and reassess and. Um, not be in different hotel rooms, but actually sleep in my bed every single night, every weekend. <laughs> and um, so I've, I'm writing for a new album coming out, and it's going to be a little different, um, but I'm in the midst of doing that. Um, I'm also, of course, along with the Berkeley stuff, um, I'm actually, speaking about Angela Bassett, um, so Pixar movies, uh, I can now talk about it. Because we did a recording last year, and Pixar Movies is releasing a, a movie called uh, Soul, and it's about an individual a band teacher who is a brother, and he wanted to tap into his purpose, uh, his soul. And so I'm actually playing the saxophone as is a black um, black woman. Her name is Dorotha or something like Wait, that. Wait, so you're acting? I'm not acting. The ironic thing is I'm playing the sax, like all the saxophone parts and we had recorded it, but they had changed. The character had kind of looked, she had more of a fro. And, um, and so basically after we recorded it, um, they kind of, they changed the image of the lady to look more like me. And, but I'm playing all of the saxophone parts. So that should be, that is coming out on, um, I can't remember what platform, but it's Disney Pixar movies called Soul on December 25th. And I'm really excited because Jonathan Baptiste was um, was the pianist, musical arranger. Angela Bassett is actually the voice of the character that I'm playing. Oh, so it, It's like full circle. And I didn't realize that. I was like, what? Angela? But it's really, it's really exciting for me. So I haven't seen the movie yet. And um, I'm waiting on December 25th. And then uh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, where's the premiere? Where's I the- know, I know. They do have a trailer out. You can Google the trailer and you'll see this black woman kind of looking sideways, you know, at the pianist. 
when he's auditioning, but I'm playing that part. And it's funny because they had, they had um, video cameras on not only my face, but my hands. So all the notes that I'm playing, they're going to mimic ex the exact fingerings, which is rare because usually cartoons, you know, they just kind of, but it's going to be the exact fingerings. They changed the ligature, which is this thing, speaking about saxophone day. Like they, they just changed everything to mimic my saxophone. And I'm just so excited about that. Honor. Yeah, such an honor. Oh, and Angela Bassett, come on. This is like take two. <laughs> Talk about Queen. Yes. Angela Wakanda forever. Right. Oh. Yes. Ha! <laughs> I love, love, love. Well, listen, my love, I want you to give everybody your social media. Okay. Because there, we need more saxophone. We need yeah. music because you play piano, right? You play other instruments. A little bit. Yeah, I play flute, saxophone mainly, um, and then alto, soprano, saxophone. I marched drums in high school, but now, you know, I, that that doesn't really count. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I'm sure but, you could get on it. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I try to show my students a little something, something. A little okay. thing on thing. <laughs> All right, tell us your social media. Where can we find yeah. you? Um, on IG, it's Tia Fuller one. And then on, um, Instagram, it's Tia Fuller jazz. Um, and, and then I, of course I have a website. It's Tia Fuller.com. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not, I really don't tweet, but I think that's Tia Fuller something. Yeah. <laughs> gotta, I know it's a little funny, but we got it. Yeah. I know it's kind of weird. I'm yeah. Yeah. It's a lot to keep up with. Yeah, it's too much. We're gonna, <laughs> but we're gonna get through it. <laughs> yes, we are, Javier. I love. Thank you so much for taking the time again. I know you're super, super, super busy. No, thank you for having me and making me aware of saxophone day tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Please give a hug and kisses to your family for me. Likewise, Margo. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to her right now. She called. This so. <laughs> oh, please tell her that I just give her lots of virtual hugs. I will. We'll talk soon. Okay, Bye. thank you. Bye. 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 All right, guys. Well, Bye. Listen, thank you so much to our guests. Tia Fuller, Kenneth Romero, and Federico de Jesus for joining us today. And you know what? For using their lives, their talents, their brains, not only to create opportunities, but also to empower every human being to be in their best that they can be. And you know, they all work at creating social change, whether it's from an artistic standpoint, politics, whatever it is, everybody on here is working to create change. So thank you again for watching and we will see you next week. Again, please wear a mask and look, we're going to leave you with Tia Fuller's Diamond Cut Band playing Dizzy Dead at Monterey's Jazz Festival in 2008. Oh. And I got to tell you, Tia does an incredible job. Take on the classic Save Your Love For Me. So guys, please enjoy. Remember to stay curious, Stay gorgeous y amable. All right, guys. I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.